This is Champagne Problems, where we come together to explore the gray areas of drinking. This is a judgment-free zone where we can all take a look at how we make decisions about our relationship with alcohol. Welcome back, all you sweet, sweet people. Today, we've got Derek Brown on the show. Derek is a renowned mixologist in the D.C. area. He's a no and low alcohol cocktail expert. He's an author, a wellness coach, and recently founded a company called Positive Damage, whose mission is to simply change the way we drink. Derek is speaking our language, and it seems his company is doing and about to do some pretty big things. Let's go to Derek. Derek Brown, welcome to Champagne Problems. Hello, how are you? Thanks for having me. We're doing great, man. We are uh, pumped to have you on. Um, you know, I've seen your name across my my feeds for some time now, and I and I, I guess that's the algorithm telling us to <laughs> to connect in some way. That's right. It's about the, the only great thing algorithm like in the sky. Yeah. yeah, it's the only fucking thing yeah. I like about that yeah. damn thing. <laughs> um, all right, so. Here's how we start. We like to rapid fire a couple questions to get to know you. Um, mm-hmm. Something we've kind of recently started doing, but it is pretty fun. So we're okay. going to start with what was your first live concert and where? It was uh, Meriwether Post Pavilion um, in, uh, I guess that's in Virginia, Maryland, Virginia. Um, and I've been there for a while, obviously. And it was the Violent Femmes. And oh. I actually have an amazing story about it. I don't know if we go in here. Please, now, but I, please, okay. yeah, let her rip. Please go into it. So I was, I was like twelve or thirteen years old, and I was so excited to meet anybody rock star. And so the Violent Femmes were there, and they were playing with the Pogues, right? And so my wow. uncle actually had the, um, he worked backstage doing the lighting, so he let me backstage with my friend, and the Violent Femmes passed us, and I was so excited, and I wanted to say like, "Hi, how are you doing?" So I walked up to him, they just zipped right past us. I mean, we did not <laughs> exist. I'm not surprised, you know, Lee, like 15 yeah. year old yeah, kids. Yeah. But... Now the funny part of it is Shane McGowan from the Pogues sees all this because he was standing. I didn't know the Pogues at the time, and he walks over and he sh- shook our hands. Now he was. Uh, in, not what I would call the most sober of human beings, <laughs> right. um, but he but he was aware of all this and he shook our hands and said, thanks for coming to the concert. And I was forever a Pogues fan after that and fuck the violent fence. You know? yes! <laughs> yeah, yeah, there we go. Love it. <laughs> that is a killer story. Oh, all right. all right. What food's your guilty pleasure? Oh, yeah. It's chocolate and peanut butter in all its weird forms. I <laughs> yeah. love that. There's a lot of them. <laughs> What comedy movie have you seen the most times? Comedy, oh, probably Step Brothers or um, uh, the other guys. Love yeah. it. You're a feral both, fan. Both classics. Uh, what can make you lose your temper like a child? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, I shouldn't admit it, but it's when my son is eight years old. He's late for things. I get all flustered and frustrated. <laughs> But then I've learned to like, do meditation and everything things to keep it down. But I like yeah. that for some reason. I don't know. It's stuck to come some Damn some kind kids. of childhood trauma or something. But I like get all freaked yeah. out. So these have been they've, these have been some common answers recently. It's, yeah. it's, it's step brothers and kids. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's the the mantra. He's eight years old. Yeah. He's eight years old. Yeah. Right. What's your favorite outdoor view? Some place in the Shenandoah. Um, for sure, yeah. Shenandoah Mountains uh, in Virginia nice. and West Love Virginia. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thanks for doing that. Now we know you. Yeah, there we go. That's <laughs> it, right? That's the whole thing. Yeah, we're done. We're That's done. Our <laughs> listeners and, uh, who cares about content? Um, no. All right. So we'll dive in. Um, all right. So Derek Brown, tell us a little bit about your professional life. Um, I, I, I'd like to, to dig into kind of your early early professional life leading up to the shift you made a few years ago. Yeah, you got it. So I um, started in the hospitality industry, restaurants and bars when I was 16 years old. I'd actually left my house um, and I started working at a place called BJ Pumpernickels in Olney, Maryland, which was a Jewish deli. And I lived at the time, my friend Adam, I lived with his family. Um, they were kind to take me in and, and, and I worked in the back of the house. I was a garde manger, which actually they didn't call me a garde manger. They just called me a salad prep. 
And basically what I would do is I would lay out three different types of salad, the white fish salad, the tuna fish salad, and the egg salad on a bed of romaine lettuce and put different olives uh, on the top of it, like green or black or whatever. I, it was, that was as creative as I wanted it to be. Um, <laughs> And and so that was the beginning of my professional career, although honestly, I had no idea what I was doing. And I talked a lot in the kitchen, which Barry Schwartz, the owner and the person I was staying with, did not like at all. So one day he comes over to me and grabs, he's a huge man, a bear of a man, and just grabbed me by the shoulder and pulled me out of my station and put me behind the deli counter. And he said, here, this is where you can put that mouth to work. And so I started slicing, uh, you know, beef tongue and uh, slinging kasha varnishkas and various things that I had no idea what they were. A Catholic boy, I was all of a sudden introduced to Jewish cuisine and it was wonderful and, and awesome. But that's where I started. And that's how I went from back of the house, as we call it in the industry, to front of the house. Yeah. Um, so after that, I, you know, worked in various jobs uh, in the industry, you know, everything from, you know, a host to a bar back and, and what have you. And I guess that it was sometime around 27. So I'm a late bloomer um, in that regard. But 27 that I had realized that I was kind of a shiftless loser. Like I had no idea what I was going to do in my life. Um, and I didn't have any money in the bank and I didn't have any prospects or ideas of what I was going to do. So I read this book called Straight Up or on the Rocks by William Grimes. And I got really excited about this history of bartending, right? So I didn't know at the time that bartending was this like really great American tradition and that there was these like, you know, guys in like white jackets with diamond pins who were like creating all these amazing recipes. I thought it was just slinging beer, you know, like or twisty or mustaches. <laughs> Definitely yeah, Tom, twisty Tom mustaches. Cruise cocktail man, <laughs> fucking juggling yeah, yeah. The liquor bottles. Yeah, it's a culture. exactly. Yeah. I thought it was just juggling liquor bottles and serving <laughs> pink pink squirrels, whatever that was. <laughs> so I read about this great history, and I was so excited about it. I was like, you know what? I don't know who is the best bartender in the world, but I'm not sure why I can't be that person. And so that's when I started to learn everything I could about bartending, and that you know, to me really set me up to like on this path. And I, you know, I, we'll get into it, but I never, I'm certainly not the best bartender in the world, but, but I got yeah, you're, on the you're list. Up there. I got on the list of the top hundred people influencing the drinks industry in 2020. And I, I was number, I don't know, 57 or something. So I was like, okay, wow. you know, I'll take it. 57. That's pretty Yeah, good. In the world. Globally, Jesus. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. So. So like, you know, shoot for the moon and end up among the stars, I guess is the. Yeah. The, wow. But, you know, but I guess, and this might prelude what we talk about later, but what happened is I started learning how to be a, a, a man, be a person in this industry, right? Um, I learned how to drink from grizzled old line cooks and waitresses, you know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know if that was always the, the, they were wonderful human beings. And I, I I know that like, you know, Anthony Bourdain talked about it, about this group of misfits in the bar and restaurant industry and how wonderful I felt like I connected to them in so many ways. But that's where I learned to drink. And that's where I learned to be. And I didn't always learn the best lessons from them, yeah. even if they were uh, yeah. great people. Yeah. Some fun, though. <laughs> all, the, all the line <laughs> cooks I ever drank with were fun people. Yeah. Well, do you know, uh, do you know the name Steve Palmer? Um, yeah. Yeah. He, he was on the show. He talks a lot about that as well. Just the culture and, and kind of growing up in that world. And, you know, you learn, you learn similar lessons you do anywhere, but just you learn them a little differently. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of a school of hard knocks there, but so, right. so when I dedicated myself to this idea that I was going to be the best that I could be at this, um, this profession that I happen to be in, it was all uphill from there in some ways. In other ways, it wasn't. But in some ways, it was all uphill. And, and um, you know, I started studying. I got local recognition. Um, I started getting national recognition. In 2015, I was named uh, the best bartender in the U.S. by Imbibe Magazine. In 20 the, best. And I, the best in the U.S. The best. Oh, wow, right. dude. And then I was... Um, you know, I opened my bar called the Columbia Room. And in 2017, that won the best American cocktail bar um, in the U.S. And so 
that was like, you know, it, it really, I just, the way that I think the, the type of person I am is I just dive into whatever subject and I learn everything about it. Some people call it neurodivergence. Some people <laughs> call it, um, you know, spectrum, whatever it is. I just uh, really yeah, get, OCD, yeah. yeah, I really get <laughs> focused on a subject and bartending was the one that I wanted to learn everything about. And I learned a lot about it. And so when I came up for air and I had, you know, learned all this stuff, um, I started really getting recognized for it. And, and I started doing things like I wrote for the Atlantic on cocktails and spirits. Um, I was named the chief spirits advi advisor to the National Archives, which I guess technically made me the highest ranking bartender in the U.S. government. Um, I got to go sling drinks at the White House for the Obama White House. And so it was, yeah, I was uh, in some ways at the top of my game and doing some really amazing stuff. In other ways, I wasn't doing so great. Right. Right. Understood so, that. Understood yeah. that. Let's we'll dig into that in a second because I have just a burning question I have to ask. What makes you that highly ranked of a bartender? What are the skill sets? I mean, it's obviously there's the pra flavor profile, but there's also I'm sure like an entertainment you gotta piece be a good and therapist. a personality and <laughs> what 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 makes you so good? I mean, I think at the end of the day, there's a is a pretty relative in many ways, because I think the best bartender is the, the one that you go to their bar, you sit down and they make sure that you have a great time, you know, that you can enjoy your company, that you can enjoy the time you spend and you don't have to stress out and worry. You don't have to like, you know, hey, can I get this drink or, you know, it's somebody who, you know, is in control of the environment and takes care of you. Um, you know, I think that's what this industry is about at its heart is about service is about serving people. And I think that when that's done well, it means that a person gets to live their lives in whatever way they choose. You know, like I love the idea of creating cocktails so great and an environment so great and service so great that, that person can, can enjoy their conversation. Mm. That's it. Right. I mean, to me, that's what it's all about. That's so, so that's really the best bartender, but what, what I guess made me the best bartender and people would, um, you know, look at my accomplishments is I learned a lot of recipes, a lot of classic recipes. I learned a lot of techniques. I learned to make really incredible um, culinary cocktails. Um, I was able to share this information in a way that I think was exciting to people. Um, and I created a bar that I think was among the best in the world. So, I, you know, that's probably why I got the recognition I got. But at the end of the day, it's really relative. There's somebody in you know some small town is is showing up at a uh, local bar and that person knows their drink and is pushing it across the table and that's the best bartender in the world to be honest with you at that moment i love it i love it were you one of those guys that could remember everybody's name uh no but i pretended <laughs> like I, yeah. right, right. hey I should, hey I guy <laughs> i was like yeah you're that drink that you ordered and, and i always him. I always knew the recipe, even though if I, I sometimes just make it up, you know, like I remember what, before I got to the craft cocktail portion of it, people would come into my bar and they'd ask for like, I don't know, you know, these terrible named drinks, like a redheaded slut or something like that. And I would, I would say up. like, I'd say, <laughs> oh, I, that's, that's with the, and I would, you know, grenadine and vodka or something They'd be like, no, no, no. It's actually with whiskey I'd be like, oh that's right we make it with granny and vodka which way do you want you know? that's <laughs> yeah. kind of like how i would navigate oh, yeah. so. <laughs> there was a there was an old bartender in new york city that my dad took me to when i was in like college we walk in he introduces me to this man i have a bloody mary or something i go back to college maybe eight years later i moved to manhattan live in manhattan go to that bar and he fucking remembered my name that's creepy <laughs> it's insane Insane. The very I up my drink, first, but no. <laughs> the very first celebrity bartender in the U.S. was a guy by the name of Willard. His real name was Erasmus Willard, but they just went by the name Willard. And the, his celebrity was known because there was like letters written from different countries talking about his fame. And he worked at the City Hotel in New York. Um, and that was what they noted him for. Not only did he make these great, I guess it was like peach juleps. Yeah, you know, and this is sometime in the beginning of the 19th century. It definitely, like, you know, that was one of what was required of a bartender to to be friendly and to know people and connect to people. I think that is an important part of bartending, you know? So I love that story. I think that's great. So was drinking a, a, an issue for you during this time? Were you... <laughs> 
It was not um, in a funny way because I didn't know it was an issue. It was absolutely uh -huh. a problem, but right. I did not know it was a problem. And that's part of the reason because of how I had learned to normalize it, right? I mean, it was not strange for me to have 20 drinks in a night. It was not strange for me to drink every night. It was not strange to wake up and have a hangover kit where I had like a bottle of Gatorade and some ramen and ibuprofen. And that's how I had to start my day. None of that was weird to me because it was common in the industry. I just rolled with it. And I, I remember there was this one time, so I am a spirits judge too. So I get to taste spirits and, and give them medals and stuff, gold medal, silver medal, whatever. And so I was working for this world spirits competition. Um, and in the course of a few days, I tasted hundreds of spirits. And, and though you actually expectorate or spit out most of them, they're still absorbed through your mouth in a way, you know, so you get a little buzzed at the end of the day. And then I would go out drinking afterwards, you know, until whatever hours in the morning. And then the next week I went to the bourbon trail um, where I went to a number of different distilleries in Kentucky. And I drank constantly during that period. And then after that, I went to another competition with uh, craft spirits. And I was at one distillery and I took a sip of something and I felt hollow and dead all of a sudden. Like it was the most amazing feeling. I went into the bathroom and sweat just poured from every pore of my body. And I was covered like I'd just taken a shower and I was obviously overheating. I, I, I sat in that bathroom for about 10 minutes until somebody knocked on the door and was like, hey, uh, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I think I just ate some bad stuff. I ate some bad stuff. What happened was my liver was overloaded and it was telling me, this is it. Stop, right? Huh. You're going to die if you keep this up. I'm going to quit on you. And I didn't know that. I I really just thought, eh, I probably just ate something bad. And so, how, old, how old were you at this time? I was in my 30s, so old enough to know better, in all fairness. Yeah. But <laughs> but but I so after that, I just kind of like, you know, cleaned myself up and went about my business. I didn't really think about it. It wasn't until later in my life that I realized, oh my gosh, I I have been drinking way too much. And that's what happens when you drink too much. You know, you can put yourself in serious risk of whatever, not good stuff. So so are you saying, and, and not to simplify it, but you got to a point where the physical manifestations were starting to, to become the issue? It wasn't like, you know, being arrested and getting thrown in jail and all these consequences. It was more your body was taking a toll? Well, it was everything. All the outcomes in my life were not good. I was getting okay. divorced. My health okay. was shit. You know, my, my relationships, my friendships were strained. Everything was kind of pushed to a limit. Um, and I looked around and I was like, this is just not good. But it really was what changed everything for me was a um, macro dose of LSD. But I, oh. so, so I want to start by saying I'm not recommending this. Uh, sure. to, but, sure. but this is what happened. One night I was I was very drunk and a friend of mine offered me a uh, hit of LSD. A, a, and so I said, yeah, OK, cool. That sounds like fun. And it, this was not to achieve some level of consciousness. This was to obliterate my consciousness. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, I was in the middle of a separation from my son's mother. I was um, pretty distraught. And so I took that. Um, I might have taken another. And I don't know. I might have taken another. But 14 hours later, I was in a bathtub you know, like pouring warm water and blasting classical music, trying to like you know, revive myself. I was at the very lowest I'd ever been in my life. You know, like I what I described it as nothing short of soul scraping, you know, and and that moment that I was at, a lot of people that I know in this industry and in life, they chose something different than I chose. And they're not here today. What I chose was, and I thought about my kid and I thought about the things that I I I I, you know, that I had in my life that were valuable and I didn't want to throw them away. And so I left that, I got help. And so I ended up going to an outpatient program um, that was dual diagnosis. I, I started focusing on my mental health and my drinking um, and substance use. And that, that made all the difference. But so I don't recommend a heroic dose of acid to change your life. But quite literally before that, I had no idea. You know, like I was just in this rut. I didn't know. I didn't really realize why. I mean, I guess it was at the end of that trip that I started thinking about alcohol and the pluses and minuses. You know, I started to see that like it had gone 
from the black to the red. And that all these wonderful experiences in my life were from alcohol, right? I had won these, all these awards. Um, I was this great personality. You know, I'd been on the Mar Martha Stewart show, you know, for God's sakes, I was successful, you know, yeah. but um, it, it was over for me that it was no longer serving me in the way that I needed. And so I decided that was that I, I had to change my relationship to alcohol and I had to change my relationship to me. So, so there was a lot uh, in that, but, but that was the moment that it all came together. Was there any kind of like grieving conflict there at that point where you like, cause you had your drinking, but you also had your identity in, you know, kind of wrapped up in the, in the bartending world and it was like, you know, one can't happen without the other. So was it like, if I give up drinking, I have to give up all of this. Like, was that present for you at that time? Yeah, I, I was terrified. I was terrified. I had no idea what I was going to do. I was sitting there recognizing. I came out of this program and I realized I had a problem, right? And I realized I had to change. But all this time I'd been telling people, drink this, drink that. And what was I supposed to do now? Say, just kidding, don't drink, right? Like I was really um, in this state where I was just, um, I thought, what am I going to do? I mean, I guess I can sell real estate or something, you know, like I had no idea. And I, I, I just started talking to people I care about. And I talked about what I, what, what I was learning and what was, I was learning about myself. And a lot of people who were close to me said, you can still do the same thing. You don't have to talk about alcohol alone. You know, all this time you've been talking about better drinking, right? You've been saying here, instead of having this red slide, you know, like have a actually good drink, you know, and now, instead of saying you have to have a high proof rye, you say you can have that or you can have this great non-alcoholic cocktail or low alcohol cocktail. And that's when I started to realize that there was a path for me and it wasn't all that different. You know, what I'm against is not alcohol, right? I think alcohol can is wonderful for the people it's wonderful for. And um, it's a piece of social technology that works for them and they enjoy it. There's connoisseurship around it. There's sacredness around it, all of that. but um, for some people, it just doesn't work. And for some people, it might not work for them at that moment, right? It might be that they have um, a meeting the next day or they have a marathon to run. And so they don't want to drink and they want options. And so that's what I decided would be my path, that I would kind of be this Pied Piper of no and low alcohol cocktails. And so in doing that, I would offer people choice. Um, and we could you know, kind of bend the narrative around you have to drink whenever you're a bar, you have to drink whenever you're in a social experience to mindful drinking, you drink on your terms, how you want to feel. Hmm. How long did it take you to kind of figure that out or make that shift? Like, oh, I mean, just in terms five of or six years, you know, <laughs> short time. No, well, well, no, I mean, that's a big, that's a big realization to like, you know, go from problematic drinking and then getting some help and, and going through an outpatient program and then kind of struggling with what you're going to do career wise. And then all of a sudden it's like, boom, figured it out. You know, this is the path. So that, that took a good, a good chunk of time. Yeah. I mean, the whole arc was about five or six years, but in 2019, I wrote my first book. It's called spirit, sugar, water, bitters, how the cocktail conquered the world. Um, and it's mostly a history book, but history told over the bar. So it's not a very dense kind of like scholarly work. It's more here, are the stories behind some of your favorite cocktails or. That's um, cool. And in writing that, you, if if a person read carefully, they could see this This sounds like his swan song, like he's done with it. Because in it, it's like, I've enjoyed being a bartender and this is all I know about bartending. And I thought that was going to be the bookmark. And then I was going to move on. But in 2021, early this year, I released Mindful Mixology, a comprehensive guide to no and low alcohol cocktails. And then that to me formed the 10th chapter of that book, right? I was like, this is where I would go next. Here's all this yeah. great history and some delicious recipes. Here's the choice that you have. And it involves some history and delicious recipes, but it's now with no and low alcohol cocktails. That's fascinating. Derek, first, I want to say thanks for sharing a little bit about the struggle. Um, that's I know that's that's a vulnerable piece, and uh, so we thank you for doing that. Thank you. Man, I, there's so many questions I want to ask just because – it's what you're doing now falls into this space that a lot of us are in. I mean, Patrick and I both don't drink anymore, but we, we work in a completely different industry, but our mission is very similar. You know, we're trying to change the way people think about this thing and, and change the way the, 
like you, like your the mission of your company, and, and let's talk about your company. So let's let's just shift mm -hmm. into positive damage. Tell us a little bit more about that mission, because I know uh, as simply it's like let's I want to change the way people drink. Yeah, and 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 in a way, I want to teach people how to drink. Right? I want. I mean, think about like I got a question for you all first. Okay. Who taught you how to drink? Did anyone ever sit you down and say, this is uh, alcohol. This has destroyed civilizations. <laughs> this is how you should go about drinking it. Uh, nobody. No. Yeah. <laughs> nobody taught me in a formal way like that. Yeah. Only, only by that. example. I guess that's what they do in Europe. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, compared to how we do it. <laughs> well, I think that's the point is that like there's so often that people... I, I learned from, you know, uh, from peers I, and I learned from grizzled yeah. line cooks and, and Hot I, beer. yeah. And, and, yeah. and, and I learned that you drink during work, you drink after work, you drink during the day, you drink whenever you want to drink, you know, and, and I never knew it was a problem until it was a problem, you know? And so I think that, you know, my goal is to say, you know, not only do I want to offer this opportunity for people to reevaluate the way they drink and change the way they drink, right? And say, okay, there are options. You can do whatever you want. You're a human being and alcohol is should be available. I don't, I'm not a prohibitionist or I'm not against alcohol, but just know what you're going to do, right? Understand yeah. it. Drink with intention. That's it. You know, yeah. that's all I ask for mindful drinking. But I also say, you know, who taught you how to drink and what were those lessons and were they good lessons, right? Were they the best use of this drug, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's, you know, part of my mission too. And I love that that's your all's mission and thank you all for including me in your mission. Um, but I think that like, we have to get that out there and say, you know, think about sex, right? People have this conversation. I can't believe that there's only quote unquote one conversation about sex, but they, you know, parents will, theoretically sit down, it never happened to me, but theoretically sit their kids down and talk <laughs> about sex, right? Yeah. At least once. I hope they do it more than once. Um, but very often the only message they get with alcohol is do it or don't do it, right? Do it because I'm doing it and I'm drunk at our holiday party and we're having fun and this is where daddy lets loose um, or don't do it because it'll ruin your life. And I think it's much more complicated than that. Well, no question. And, and, you know, our mission falls very much in the educational space, which is exactly what it sounds like a piece of yours is. It's not some, it's not just how to drink. It's what are you drinking and what are the possibilities and what are the risks and what is the history and what is the science and all of that stuff involved. That's where we fall in. We are trying to get out ahead and just educate people on everything so they can make rational decisions. I love that. I think yeah. that's really important. And, and part of that, you know, um, teaching for me is saying, okay, the reasons you drink, sometimes it has to do with that social experience, you know, like going to a bar and being with friends and, and being in this environment that's really cozy and the, the lights are low and the music is great. Um, but how much of the positive emotions you're experiencing are from alcohol mm -hmm. and how much are just from being in a great environment, drinking something complicated and interesting and being together, you know what I mean? Like, I think that alcohol does a lot of things, but we also ascribe a lot of things to alcohol that it probably isn't doing, that really is something that we're doing for ourselves, right? So having those choices, having non-alcoholic or low alcoholic drinks, you can have the same experience experiences in bars, in restaurants, in with your family at holiday gatherings. Right now, you know, we're facing down the New Year's and, and so many people are going to um, be cheersing with, you know, champagne, the eponymous name of this, this podcast. And so, so I think, you know, and, and I don't want them to stop doing that because I don't want them to stop being together and I don't want them to stop enjoying their lives and I don't want them to stop. But I, I would like that option that they can say, I'm going to do a glass of champagne and then a glass of non-alcoholic sparkling wine, or I'm going to choose a non-alcoholic cocktail because that's what I want to do. And that's what, how I want to feel on New Year's Day. You know, I want to feel awake and alive and ready to take on the day and not necessarily suffering the effects of alcohol. You know, so, so I think it's about options. It's about education. And it's about showing people that the experiences that they have don't necessarily have to be with alcohol. 
What's that framework look like for you, like in terms of how you teach people or the message that you're trying to get across in terms of intentional drinking? I mean, I know you just kind of described it a little bit, but do you have like kind of a recipe for that or a framework that people or that you suggest that people, you know, work from? Yeah, I, I do. And in this sense that it, it maybe it's not like a, a the most, you know, well thought out framework, but it, it starts with a, a, a very simple question with how do you want to feel? Right. I think that's the basis of all of this. It's not just what do you want to drink, but how do you want to feel? And I, like I think that from starting with that, you can adopt all of these strategies to feel the way that you want to feel. Right. So it is true that when you are going out to social experiences, that people pressure you into drinking, right? Or you feel just stressed and you want the alcohol because you think that's going to de-stress you. Mm-hmm. Obviously, it, it doesn't work like that. Now, I wish it worked like that. That would be wonderful if you just drank alcohol and you were no longer stressed. But that's not what happens. In fact, it's even worse than that. It makes you more stressed in the long run. And so I think that like if stress and peer pressure and habit are the things that are driving your drinking, if that's where you start from, you say, okay, that's not where I want to be, though. That's not how I want to feel. Then the next thing is, what can we do to get you to the place where you feel the way you want to feel. Um, For some people, that means that they have to kind of invent stories around drinking, right? So you're at a party and somebody says, do you want to drink? And you say, no. And then they expect you to tell your whole life story, right? Which is too annoying to do Um, for everybody. Some people you want to, some people you don't. Um, I don't want to know it is. (laughs) So if I drink, there's a slight probability that I might kill you. (laughs) A great answer. A great answer, right? And, That'll wrap it right up. And absolutely, humor can be a great way to deflect it. In some cases, you just have to lie. Say, I'm on antibiotics or I have a meeting tomorrow. I don't want to. You know, for some people, they have to do that. For other people, it's about setting goals. And just, I, I want to drink two drinks tonight. That's where I'm going to end, right? And if they set that goal and they can keep that goal, then they're great. If they can't, keep that goal, then they have to move on and create new strategies, whether that's inviting a friend along, whether that's, you know, alternating between no and low alcohol cocktails, whether that's just, you know, not going at all and creating a scenario where you're still connecting with people and still enjoying yourself because you don't want to sit at home sipping soda water by yourself, but you want to create an experience. I call it, you know, Jomo, the joy of missing out. Right. (laughs) So I think that like there's lots of strategies you can adopt to try to um, to to affect the way you're drinking and ultimately the the way you want to feel. But I do think it starts with that question. Um, Yeah, I do think that for some people, that question will be compulsion in a way that's way beyond peer pressure and stress. Um, And that's not that's not the area that I'm an expert in. Right. I mean, personally, I've gone through it um, and I can tell my story, but I'm not like a recovery coach and I'm not a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a specialist in, in, in um, uh, alcohol use disorder or substance use disorder. Mm-hmm. So so that's to me, that's another level. And that requires intervention at, at a medical level or in terms of, you know, seeking out um, a therapist or a group, a meeting or smart recovery or whatever it is that yeah. you connect with. I think that's a different level, but, but for those people who are it's in the realm of peer pressure and habit and stress, I think, you know, it's about, you know, asking yourself questions, setting goals, and then finding the strategies to meet those goals. Yeah. I love that, man. And I, and I, I think, I think the, the key is, is just to get curious and then experiment with it. Like if you're in that realm of drinking for those reasons like I, I think you know you hit the nail on the head it's just kind of figuring out what works for you and and committing to figuring that out well and it's and it's awareness obviously and it's you know everything we talked about before where you know a lot of these people that do fall into that higher end of the spectrum that that you just referred to a lot of that is is progressive people get right. to that point you know no, they didn't start right. there so it's how do you get out ahead of that because all the people that are in this larger part of the population have a risk of reaching to that that point so everything you're talking about education teaching people how to mindful drink um why do you drink what do you want to feel I, man i love i really 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 love that um because i think about I, i'm a father now and i have a 12 year old who's I mean, we're a couple years off of, of those years that it's it's 
potentially coming and and you know the big question and we even have guests on here how do we educate how do we get out ahead of it how do we prevent you know all these things and I love that answer that question how why, how do you want to feel because I remember the first time I drank was in junior high, and it was because I was riddled with anxiety. I yep. couldn't talk to girls. I was a tall, skinny dork. I had no self-esteem. Alcohol gave me all of that. Yeah. And that's not a really good reason to drink, <laughs> no. especially yeah. to start off that way. And for me, it was something like somebody handed me a beer bong or something and be like, this will make you feel good. You know, like this will, this is the way you want to feel. And I was like, okay, cool. And then, you know, I, I threw up all over myself and then I did kind of feel good. So, yeah. uh, you know, it was like, <laughs> that was not a healthy way to learn. And, and so, yeah, if we can get ahead of that, that would be great. Um, and I think that like, it's about intrinsic motivation, right? Because a lot of times with the responsibility messaging that we hear, or the kind of what we hear from, you know, our teachers, parents, coaches, is this sort of don't do it, don't do it, don't yeah. do it, right? This extrinsic messaging. But mindful drinking is about looking inside of yourself and making choices for yourself, which is, I think, the only way you really make changes. Fear is not the best way, you know, like scaring the hell out of your children and being like, okay, look, you know, you're probably going to, oh, actually it reminds me. I remember now, I haven't talked about this for a while. I remember when I was a kid that they would show you endless pictures of car crashes <laughs> yeah. from right. alcohol. Just fear. Right? Fear, fear. And it was just like burnt out. You know, this person Guts. in the hospital, this person dead. And I was like, ah, you know, like <laughs> that's terrible. Um, didn't change one damn <laughs> thing about my relationship. This is, this is giving me anxiety. I need to yeah. forget like, those images. <laughs> And in some cases, it was exciting because now I, it's danger. I'm a little, yeah. I'm a young boy. I, I want danger. I want to live a life that's full of excitement and living on the edge, you know? So, so not good. That didn't work for me. It, it's about intrinsic motivation. It's about the choices you make for yourself, right? We can't tell anybody else you have to drink this way. But we can share with people, this is how you're going to feel if you drink this way. Um, and yeah. so one of the exciting things is that, you know, I, I'm, I'm working with the National Academy of Sports Medicine um, to, divide, to, to uh, create a program um, around mindful drinking, teaching people about mindful drinking. And so things like wow. that, where you really get into the nitty gritty of what it does to you. Um, and, and I know that you do that on your show, too, because I've listened and you have some great guests on here who talk about that. Um, and that's really important because then when you hear it, you're like, okay, wow, I didn't know that. Like a lot of people still think they're de-stressing when they drink a glass of wine at the end of the day. I think that is how I de-stress. They don't know that alcohol actually, you know, and it depends on the levels you drink it, of course, but it can cause more stress for you in the long run. You know, that's a physiological response. And so I think that um, it's helping to educate people about how it really makes you feel and then letting them making the choices for themselves. Well, this is America and we want, we want it now. Yeah. <laughs> We're not thinking long haul, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm stressed now. I want it to go away right now. Yeah. That's, that's a, that's a big part of the issue with problematic but, but drinking. There's other things that work so much better. You know what I mean? And, and some of them feel like a big mountain to climb, but they're not that hard, you know, like, um, sometimes you, you have a 12 year old, right? You, so they, they're probably playing sports at some, you know, or, um, and my son plays soccer. And so sometimes I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to go out and play soccer with him 30 minutes of that. And I automatically feel better. It's fun. Yeah. It's, yeah. You know, it feels a lot more exciting to me now. Um, cause I know how I'm going to feel afterwards. I'm going to, you know, get all the positive, um, effects of exercise and, and, and connection. Um, so, so yeah, it's kind of reframing it a little bit and saying, okay, that actually doesn't work and not even, you know, immediately it might give you this, you know, uh, this kind of physiological, uh, you know, effect where you feel disoriented and feel a little more sociable. And that's, I can see why that would feel good, but it, it, it immediately goes into the other part. You know, that's alcohol is biphasic, right? You know, it has that first part of it, which you feel good. And then after that, you're falling down, throwing up all over yourself and you've let set your life on fire <laughs> in one night so maybe that's just me though i mean this is this is kind of back to the history of bartending this is a question that i want to ask kind of off topic but 
Because I, I do want to talk about non-alcoholic spirits and what your experience has been with that, and you know a little bit of your history around that, and where where you're working in now. But I feel like the mock the the whole mocktail idea is a fairly new idea, um, or it's you know something that's that's you know gaining a little bit of traction now. But in terms of the history of of bartending, you know, because I'm assuming that you've studied all that. Has that been around for a while? Have 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 there been kind of like low alcohol or no alcohol cocktails or mo- what we call mocktails? Has that been a thing for a long time? That's just kind of you know taken off recently. Absolutely, yeah. I don't. Yeah. I mean, we have a short memory. It's called Shirley sometimes. Temple's. Yeah, <laughs> but the largest <laughs> social movement in the United States was called Temperance. Yeah. Um, now that was hijacked by extremists. Uh, imagine that in the United States, extremists <laughs> hijacking a political movement, but they did. And that turned into prohibition. But originally with temperance, the idea was that they wanted people to either drink low alcohol drinks or or reduce their drinking. And so there was a lot of products that came around out of that. And there were a lot of bartenders who also advocated for for that. So the earliest bartending guides, there's one in 1862. This is considered the first bartender's guide. It's by Jerry Thomas, and it's called um, the bartender, um, it's called the Bon Vivant's Guide or How to Fix Drinks. And um, in it, he lists a number of temperance drinks. Wow. In fact, almost as many temperance drinks as cocktails. And so this is something that is huh. part of bartending cool. history and part of our history. In fact, one of the um, uh, drinks that was created as an alternative to wine was created with cocoa wine. Um, uh, and it, you, they used the cola nut, um, for example, for example, and they used, um, acid phosphate in it. It was a phosphate soda and it's the largest drink in the world right now. I think maybe probably Coca-Cola, right? Uh, So, uh, obviously that's now become something different than it started out as, uh, Dr. Pemberton, I think who created it, you know, he was creating a, a, a cola wine that people could try in, you know, if they were uh, temperance, um, oriented, if they didn't drink. And so a lot of products and a lot of the sodas that we have today, the soft drinks actually came out of that. Um, but people want less sugary drinks these days. And so the mocktail is kind of dying, right? The idea of this mocktail, um, which is kind of a difficult word, if you really think about it, makes means to make fun of, right? So right. I think that like, um, at, at the end of the day, we're kind of dropping that terminology and saying non-alcoholic cocktail, because that that feels like an adult sophisticated drink. The other part of that is really interesting is that the first mention of the word cocktail which is in 1798, which it was in London in a, in a newspaper called the Morning Gazetteer, um, they mention a cocktail in it. And the historian David Wondrich um, goes into detail about how that may not have been a drink with alcohol. <laughs> right? I mean, the first <laughs> cocktail was with ginger, definitely. Um, and I, I'll let people look that up on their own because it involves a not safe for work story. Um, about the origin of the word cocktail. Um, <laughs> but but it definitely is contested whether it had co- uh, alcohol in it. But whether or not that's true, there's way to make there's ways to make adult sophisticated drinks that taste awesome, that have all of the complexity that you get from alcohol because alcohol is a magic molecule. There are lots of wonderful flavors and tastes that come out of that. Um, but you can do it all without alcohol. And that was the premise of my book, Mindful Mixology. I really set out to try to um, explain how you can create these drinks, even in some cases using household ingredients. So I'll give you a quick example. Lemonade is the is the sort of joke, right? If you don't get a sophisticated cocktail and you go in a bar, they're probably just going to give you soda or lemonade, maybe a Shirley Temple, as you mentioned. Um, you could start with the base of lemonade. And really the only difference between a lemonade and a Tom Collins is gin, right? Mm-hmm. So you can fill in some of the blanks. You can fill in that, um, the length you get from the gin, meaning the volume that it holds. You can get the piquancy that you get, it, which is the bite that you get from the alcohol, um, the intensity of flavor and the texture. All of that, you can use ingredients to kind of make up for that. So I have a drink called the pinch hitter, for example, that I use. Great name. God. (laughs) I use chickpea water 
which in, we call aquafaba, so it doesn't sound as gross. Um, but it's a, an ingredient commonly used in, in plant-based or vegan cooking in, in place of eggs. So you use chickpea water, salt tincture, um, apple cider vinegar, just a spoonful of that, um, and um, ginger syrup. And all of a sudden, this drink that was just lemonade becomes a, a cocktail, a sour cocktail. And so I think huh. that like it's that simple right? In a way, you know, just modulating the ingredients to make up for these categories that kind of can, are the sensory aspects of the cocktail. So, so anyway, maybe I'm getting too, too, too in depth about it. I love it. I, it's fascinating. And then there's these, all these new products uh, that are out there and they're wonderful. I mean, you have like, there's this one um, sparkling pear cider from the Swabian Alps in Germany by a guy named Jörg Geiger. He's an amazing um, sort of a cider maker. It's all non-alcoholic. He uses forged ingredients. Like it's as fancy as you want to get with this non-alcoholic, you know, wines, beers, and spirits. There's athletic brewing. Have you all ever had tried that? Oh yeah. B Bill Schufeld's been on the show. I mean, that's an amazing product that if somebody just wants a well, almost one for one beer swap out, that's it. You know, I know that these products aren't for everyone in recovery, you know, but, but sure. for those people who are just trying to have something delicious at the end of the day, or, um, when they're out with friends or, or to party, these are great, um, stand-ins, you know, and there's lots of non-alcoholic quote unquote spirits too, that are even distilled, you know? So yeah. the choices are there. Um, and they're not just the sugary mocktails of the past. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me what, what, you know, uh, around the alcohol industry mm -hmm. as kind of an animal that we're somewhat fighting against. And I, and I, and I say that in, in all sensitivity to us not fighting alcohol right. in general, but just the marketing, the pushing, the money, the lobbying, the capitalism, you know, yeah. that's, it's a pretty big battle. Yeah. <laughs> I can imagine. Um, I, in some ways, I don't really think of it in those terms because I found a liquor industry that, that's somewhat receptive to this. I realize that they are still out there trying to push their product, which is what capitalism does and what it is. So it's they're not at fault in the sense that they're some evil corporation trying to destroy human beings. But um, they're definitely pushing a product that that has some some challenges to it. <laughs> sure. So I think that, you know, but, but there are also companies that are pushing non-alcoholic spirits, right? So, so some of the larger core, and I'm not an apologist for unbridled capitalism, just say, you know, okay. somebody like Diageo is actually, they, they're making Guinness zero. They're making yeah. Seedlet there. And if the dollars are there, they'll continue making those. And right. if the dollars are there, they continue pushing them. So I think, um, it's a little bit of give and take that uh, on one hand, I would like to see them push those products more and really create a space for them. Um, but I think it's up to us as consumers also to demand those. So even yeah. though this, these choices are starting to spread, I think it's, there's lots of places you can go and not get a non-alcoholic drink. That's good. It might be yeah. just sodas at the end of the menu, you know? And so I think that what I try to do is go out there and spread this gospel and tell people about it and, and share the information. And, um, and then it provides these choices. And, and so, yeah, I think that there's probably an argument to be made against the liquor industry that, that I'm just not going to make because it's not, sure. that's not where I fight the battle. You know, I fight the battle in a, a politics of the first person, you know what I mean? Where yeah. it's person to person. Got it. And, and I appreciate you answering it that way. Cause that, that, that is, that makes a lot more sense. I think often in the work that we do in the addiction space, often we can find ourselves in a little bit more of a negative view. Um, yeah. You know, sometimes it's, it's, and we know this to be true that the, the, the alcohol industry makes the majority of its money on alcoholics, <laughs> right? It's not the guy that has one beer or, or one, you know, thimble of a, of a drink, you know, once a week, it's, it's the person that drinks a shitload and they yeah. rely on that addiction to make a lot of money. So there is, a, there is a piece of that. And, and I imagine those boardrooms are a little, a little, <laughs> there's a little bit of a different strategy going on in there. Oh, they'll just switch to non-alcoholic, <laughs> right? And then that's I, mean, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm still stuck on this temperance move, like, like, like the term soft drink. I mean, in like, 
Coca Cola being the first mocktail, like that's fascinating. I mean, I mean, it, that's it, cool it, history. I, it's freaking crazy to me, and but it's it's also weird how, like, I mean, look, you you have a cold pressed juice right here. Yeah, What's the difference delicious. between that and a mocktail, you know, or a non alcoholic cocktail? Right. I'm just now thinking about that, and you bringing up, you know, Coca Cola and soft drinks, and that kind of being. The first wave of that movement back then coming out of the temperance movement and now we're like back in that same place and we're having all these new drinks coming out but like they're just beverages exactly right? like what's the difference between that and a coca-cola like why why do we have to box it into this thing it, 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 I'm like I'm looking at this from a whole new lens now after learning this from you that's really cool I'm glad that the we talked about that. Yeah, without getting too much into lexical categorization, I'll say that um, at, what to me makes a cocktail is a certain set of sensory kind of components, and some of which I mentioned. You know, and I think yeah. that that kind of differentiates it from, in in some ways, what it is is stopping power, right? Theoretically, when you drink something, a cocktail, it's got that intensity of flavor, that piquancy, and you drink it slower. Now, I realize not everybody does that. But that's what it does, right? It has bitter flavors. It has those complex kind of like juniper, if it's gin or- You're enjoying you know, it. You're enjoying it. And it, and it, and it, your brain is like lighting up and saying, oh my God, this, yeah. this is very interesting. What is this? And, and firing dopamine, just like, you know, um, it fires when you have a great meal, you know? And so I uh -huh. think that um, that's to me, what makes a cocktail is it has that, whereas juice is generally something that's poundable. You know what I mean? It's yeah. easy to drink right, really sure. quickly, unless it's the green juice. Yeah, sometimes that one takes a little while to get down. Um, but I think that like, yeah, I, ultimately there's a, there's kind of like this interesting group of people who have never drank cocktails at all. So I had this, and I know we got to, we're probably got to wrap up soon, but I had this one friend who doesn't drink. Um, and she came to one of my cocktail classes and I was so like excited to show her how she could make these great non-alcoholic cocktails. And at the end of the class, and this person is, is fairly, um, I guess, a frank human being. And, and she said to me, those drinks were disgusting. And I was like, Whoa, <laughs> what? Why would they be disgusting? I, I work so hard. They're so delicious. They don't have alcohol. She goes, they taste like they have alcohol in them. Uh, I don't want yeah. alcohol. And I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you, Light bulb you, goes off. Oh, yeah. You want a juice. <laughs> right. You know, right. The point is, <laughs> some people have never had a cocktail or a wine or a beer. And so they might want something totally different. And we're going to see a complete change of guard with the next generation because they're not drinking the same mm -hmm. way that my generation was drinking. No, so yeah, I'm excited weed. about that. Yeah, they're all smoking <laughs> weed. Three more questions. Right. As this continues, as this shift, call it a revolution, uh, and people are drinking less, like you just said, the next generations generations are drinking less. Do you think that could potentially create a mentality shift for the pot for for the better in our country? Yes. I, I yeah. 100 percent believe that. I think the work that we're doing right here right now is laying the framework for a future where we have a better relationship with alcohol. Yeah. And oh, and sure. and I would I, I knew you were going to say yes. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm just going to also say I, I feel like, you know, as a country, we are we're struggling a little bit where there's some discontent. There's there's unhappiness. Yeah. There's insecure leadership. There's a pandemic. There's all kinds of crap going on. And people are are looking for ways to feel better. <laughs> Yeah, not in the most healthy. A lot ways. of good reasons to self-medicate. <laughs> exactly, and 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 but the point is, every one of us have to find healthier ways to relieve our stressors, our life experience, whatever it is. But if we if we do start to decrease the alcohol, as you said in the very beginning, alcohol only creates more of that crap, and we know that to be true. Yep. So if we decrease it, it just inevitably has got to create a better better mentality for our our society. I, I you know. I'm just kind it's, of for me, it was this upward spiral. When I address my relationship with alcohol, I started addressing addressing my relationship with my mental health, with my physical health, with yeah. my relationships. I started looking at myself in a way that I hadn't looked at myself before. Um, and it changed everything. 
and my life is so much better for it. And so I, I think it sometimes feels incredibly daunting because alcohol does have a way of narrowing our pleasure and making us feel this is it. My life is over if I can't drink. But it's really yeah. if you change your relationship with alcohol, it's where your life begins. Yeah, it's also a really easy way to avoid all of those things that you just mentioned, you know, exactly. every day. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. oh, I guess I'll exercise tomorrow. I guess I'll go to the doctor <laughs> next week. I guess, you know. <laughs> what are the three biggest benefits that you've seen in your own life since you've changed your relationship to alcohol? I mean, this is one that I think a lot of people share, but it's very true is I actually can sleep well now. So, yeah. I mean, and sleep, I'd had no, I, I had no idea how important sleep was. It was a complete yeah. blind spot in my life. I talked about how great uh, it was that I could like, you know, barely sleep. I'd sleep three hours a night and get all my work done. Um, I did not know that it was slowly eroding my health and my, my you know, focus and well-being and all of that. So, so that was a very simple benefit of that. Um, I started to feel, I, I did lose weight. I don't think that's the number one reason to do it, but I started to feel healthier in general. Um, and so I was able to pick skateboarding back up. So I skateboard now. Um, and that's fun and it's exercise. And I don't even really think about going to the gym. I just do stuff like that, you know? So, so, you know, just being able to feel a little healthier, a little better in my body that, that helped. Um, and the third thing was relationships, you know, like I really didn't realize how much alcohol was gumming up the works, you know, like how many yeah. fights, how many, you know, how many times that I got into this clash because my brain was just, you know, so myopic, you know, it was so focused on something that was not very important at all. Um, yes. but alcohol had, <laughs> you know, centered in on that and that was it. And this was the most important part. And I'm going to sleep on the sofa tonight, you know, like whatever dumb things I did. <laughs> I, I can stop now and say, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'll think about this some more before I say, yeah. before I do it. God, great answers. Great answers. All right. Final question. Power question. Derek mm -hmm. Brown, why do you care so damn much? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it's my son, right? Yes. I mean, it's that yes. moment where I look at somebody else and I know that they were just like me and I wish that I could give them everything that I wanted when I was a kid. And that's not things, that's morals and ethics and and direction. Um, and I love to watch him grow and be who he is. So I'm not just trying to like shape his mind so he's a little Derek. Um, but I <laughs> I want to be able to provide him with a framework that he can make good decisions in his life. And and I think that's what it comes down to. And maybe that there's a part of that that's a little selfish, a little bit of a reflection of myself. But ultimately, like when I see him thriving, the world is great. Oh, man, that's beautiful. That is beautiful. Derek Brown, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you guys so Great much. Great to meet you, this. man. I appreciate you. My pleasure. Really appreciate you guys, too. The information and opinion shared on this podcast are solely those of the hosts and guests and are not a substitute for medical advice. If you feel like you may need professional help, here are some resources. For the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration hotline, call 1-800-662-4357 or visit smsa.gov. For listeners in the Charlotte, North Carolina community, visit dilworthcenter.org or call 704-372-6969 or visit theblanchardinstitute.com or call 704-288-1097.